really critical this year is as the world seeks to establish vital new agreements on sustainable development and climate change. But in the perfect blizzard of meetings and events that surround these negotiations, it would be all too easy to forget the basic truth that no economy can thrive indefinitely without an inclusive society and a healthy natural base to sustain it. All financial capital ultimately relies 100% on the social and natural capital assets that underpin its existence and enable it to grow. It seems to me that uh, the current conventional model by which we tend to operate is, is beset by two significant failures. The first is that it is not sufficiently inclusive in terms, for example, of generating meaningful employment for the young uh, through measures such as providing apprenticeships and encouraging young entrepreneurs. And the second is that in its relentless pursuit of short-term profit, it fails to take into account the long-term consequences of resource depletion and climate instability. These dual failings of the current model are evident amongst other things in youth unemployment, widespread social exclusion, climate change, deforestation and ocean acidification, all of which will inevitably have hefty economic price tags attached to them. It seems to me that rising to the challenge of keeping all forms of capital intact, and indeed in good long-term health, will require the active engagement of a wide range of players, many of whom are, are, are gathered here today. And among you are some of the world's most influential asset managers, asset owners and corporate CEOs who have the opportunity and ability to shape the new economic agenda that we will need if we are to cope with the future we are bringing at some considerable speed upon ourselves. A future that somehow will be required to accommodate three billion more people, a global economy far bigger than today's, and with it, all the attendant increased demands that will come for jobs, public services, and natural resources. According to so many scientists and specialists, we are already breaching a plethora of planetary boundaries, so the challenges are thoroughly daunting. In meeting these immense challenges, there are perhaps several broad ways forward. One is to be found in what is increasingly referred to as the circular economy, in which waste is eliminated and instead becomes a set of resources. Nature's own economy is circular and provides the perfect example of how we can render our own economy more resilient and sustainable. But this will have to include restoring and nurturing the ecosystems that provide us with the essential services upon which all economic activity ultimately depends. Finding ways of driving investment that will value and support these ecosystems is not merely one possible option among many others. It is an urgent necessity, a prerequisite for our survival, and one which grows in importance each day as we inexorably and with notable single-mindedness increase our food, energy and water insecurity. In this regard, I, I um, am delighted that there appears to have been such an increase in the green bond market, with some expectation, I believe, that $100 billion worth of them could be issued this year. I have to confess that I take a rather proprietorial interest in that market's development, as some of its initial formulation occurred during the meetings of the P8 group of pension funds that I originally inaugurated some eight years ago. Furthermore, my International Sustainability Unit has initiated the conversations around blue bonds, which I hope will lead to their first issuance this year. But as these instruments now 
as requested, provide institutional investors with the same vanilla-type products that can scarcely raise the sensitive eyebrows of chief risk officers, they should and indeed must be used if we are going to mobilise the scale of investment required to keep us within two degrees of warming and reinstate our natural capital. But as this occurs, it seems to me that great care needs to be taken to ensure that their greenness, in other words, their environmental and social integrity, is guaranteed. We should celebrate uh, that, envir that environmental services are now starting to be recognised as an asset class in their own right, but should be ever mindful of the complex web of social and ecological factors that sustain them and indeed us. In a year uh, when it does seem as if the semaphore signals emerging from various policy conclaves are indicating that the long-awaited tough decisions are starting to be made, it is absolutely critical that the private sector stands ready to engage positively and with a full and astonishing capability of its intellectual and financial capital. You, ladies and gentlemen, are the people who can ensure that this happens. I can only pray that you do, for, to paraphrase Shakespeare, not to take this tide of opportunity will bind us in shallows and in miseries, for we must take the current when it serves or lose our, and indeed your, ventures. Barack Obama is in China today where he's attending an APEC summit meeting that is the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. Before the banquet, the participants took a group picture wearing Chinese style suits. This custom made garb is the symbol of this year's meeting. This is Obama's first trip abroad after the Democrats lost the midterm elections last Tuesday. The summit is being held in Beijing. It's dedicated to economic issues and is one of the few times when world leaders can meet in person to discuss these matters face to face. And much anticipated though by the media was of course a potential meeting between the US and Russian presidents. RT's Paul Scott has more. Amid increased tensions, uh, Presidents Putin and Obama have come face to face for the first time since the D-Day anniversary in France in June. They greeted each other and exchanged several sentences uh, here in Beijing. Now, it all came as they prepared for a photo uh, with other APEC leaders uh, here at APEC 2014 in Beijing. Uh, they were dressed in uh, brightly coloured traditional Chinese tunics. Uh, and we did hear from a Kremlin spokesman who said, that the two could have a more formal meeting in the days ahead, either here in Beijing or at the G20 gathering in Australia, which takes place next week. Well, during his keynote speech, President Putin uh, reiterated and re-emphasised the importance of the Asia-Pacific region to Russia and Russia's economy. He said that China is Russia's biggest partner in the region, and he also encouraged international companies to invest in Russia's Far East. Cooperation between Russia and Asia-Pacific nations is of the utmost importance to us. The 21st century is already called the century of the Pacific. Russia, as part of the Asia-Pacific, must use the competitive advantages provided by this rapidly developing center of economy, technology and innovation. At the same time, Russia's Far East is also providing opportunities for the countries in the region. Well, Putin also reiterated that both Russia and China were keen to expand trade using their own currencies, the ruble and the yuan. Now, this is significant because uh, both countries are prominent members of the BRICS Bank, which was established this year in an attempt to try and end the global dominance of the US dollar, which here in Beijing, President Putin said has no future, insisting that the ruble and the yuan have better long-term prospects. Now, that announcement came as China and Malaysia announced the formation of a new bank which will settle deals in local currencies, so it looks as if the US dollar could be uh, set to lose some of its regional muscle. So it looks as if the US dollar could be uh, set to lose some of its regional muscle. President Putin also addressed concerns over the volatility of the ruble at the moment. Uh, he said that Russia is doing all they can to end the decline uh, in its valuation and insisted that the fluctuations will soon come to an end. 
That was RT correspondent Paul Scott. Unfortunately, tonight for American 401ks, Wall Street in a free fall. The Dow plummeting 350 points. That's the worst drop all year. Sparked by jitters overseas, Greece on the brink of bankruptcy. And these images from Athens. ATMs boarded up out of cash and long lines at banks. Residents told they must live on $67 a day. And now Puerto Rico, the economy there said to be in a death spiral. ABC's chief business correspondent Rebecca Jarvis is here and Rebecca everyone wants to know what this means for Americans 401ks. Absolutely Amy and I've been speaking with my sources on Wall Street all throughout the day. They are preparing for more of this volatility it's ahead. Signs to be ready and there are so many things converging that we need to be ready on top of the fact and we haven't said this since I've been last year and since we were together look at what's happened to America. Oh. Look at what is happening oh. to America. Uh, I mean, we are watching such a rapid acceleration. Remember one of the things we talked about was the tipping point. That yes. when if you push something over, That's you right. reach a point where you don't have to push it anymore, it takes its own momentum and it goes faster. I believe that one of the reasons why the Harbinger came out when it did is because this was a tipping point time when for the first time a majority of Americans came out to end the biblical definition of marriage, including the president. And now we are watching then the Supreme Court and we are watching things accelerate so rapidly. So you know, the prophet said, you know, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And one of the things that we're watching is, and this is a principle, at, in the same degree that a civilization calls evil good, and this is in men, not just one evil, many evils, it will call good evil. And so we're watching, therefore, at the same time all this is happening, we're watching more and more talk about believers, they're intolerant, they're hateful, they're extreme, uh -huh. they're, you know, and we are watching the beginnings of persecution. We are watching, you know, when they tried to pass laws to protecting Christians, yeah. you know, they, they failed all over. And so we are watching, we're watching right now where a gov the government is telling Believers, they have to support, they have to not only support abortion, they have to pay for abortion. Exactly. We never had this before. Right. And so we are watching, uh, so, so on one hand, and this follows the progression of the, of the harbinger, the harbinger, not just the signs, it's that you had Israel being warned, but continually moving away from God to judgment. We're watching that in America is repeating the last days of ancient Israel. That's why the harbinger are appearing and that's why it's happening. So, so as we watch that, that is part of the picture too. We're watching prophecy every day. Every day you hear news about what this apostasy it's another sign of where we're going so God has to I mean you know I mean how could he not I mean God is not mocked right. God has to you know people say well you know it's scary if you're gonna there's gonna be shaking I'll say it's, it's opposite it'll be it's scary if there's not a shaking because if we don't have a shaking there's no hope you know in shaking that most of us came to the Lord because there was some shaking in our life yeah so God loves America that's why amen. that's why there has to be shaking in this land amen wow what a word so the blood moons, are they signs usually of judgment, would you say? They, they, they can be. Now, now the, the rabbis wrote, and this is not the Bible, and this is not authoritative, but the rabbis wrote that a lunar eclipse is a sign of judgment for Israel, upon Israel. And the, the main thing about the blood moons are lunar eclipses. So that's why I say, could, there something, could something significant happen regarding Israel or war? Or the, on the other hand, they also said they said solar eclipses are signs of judgment on the nations. Now it's interesting because the solar we're going to see the solar eclipses because there's also solar eclipses in this time. Yes. And two of in, in 2015, two of them uh, fall on Jewish holy days. And they and they are totally linked to the Shemitah. The both eclipses. Oh. Both so and that and the Shemitah seems to be linked to also America and then the world. So that's what they're, they're, we're going to talk also, when we get into the Shemitah, the link between that and the, the solar eclipses as well. So they, they have been, and you know, one of the things that Mark talked about, or it is also that at the time of the destruction of the temple, you find all these convergences. You find the eclipses falling on the holy days. I mean, one after the other, one after the other. So they could be, it doesn't mean every eclipse, there's, there's about two eclipses a year, but when they, when you have these patterns, it's, it's, it's something to take note of and to leave.